started and uh, we can start uh, with our panel. So let me welcome you at the panel number six of the CEEC conference. Uh, this one will be about buildings. So we will pretty much follow up on the previous panel, which was about uh, the heating uh, system. Uh, we will be looking more closely at the role of the building sector in securing uh, clean energy transition, uh, especially in the light of the dependence on the Russian gas, uh, more and more countries push uh, for energy efficiency measures. And I think that in this panel and in this debate, there will be no doubt that uh, we need energy efficiency measures. Uh, what I would like to go more in depth into is whether we are on the right track uh, when it comes to sustainability in the building sector, uh, both in terms of policies, mechanisms, uh, financing and implementation, or whether we need to speed up and do more. Uh, so I would hope that we will come and define concrete measures that might help us to accelerate. Uh, the decarbonization and en energy saving and the transition towards green economy. So a lot and very important topics ahead of us. Uh, my name is Katarina Nikodemova and I am the director of the platform Buildings for the Future, which is based here in Slovakia. And I'm very glad that I'm not here alone for this discussion, but I have very profound guests joining me. So at this point, I would like to welcome and I will start here. Uh, Livia Vashakova, Director General of the Recovery Plan Department. Good afternoon. Uh, then we have Justina Glusman, Managing Director of Fala Renovaci from Poland. Uh, Andra Reit, CEO of Advanced Building and Urban Design from Hungary. Hello, everyone. Uh, Lubica Šimkovicová, President of Passive House Institute Slovakia and Manifest 2020. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Lenka Vanek, Head of the Innovation and Decarbonization of Chess Esco Group. Hello, everyone. So I am very glad that you are all, he all here in person uh, because I think it's uh, much better than, uh, than online connections. And I think it, this is uh, the biggest uh, here present panel that we have. So I hope we will manage to cover all the topics in time. Uh, what you can expect uh, from this panel, I, will, uh, I would like to give each of the panelists uh, a little bit of space for introductory remarks. And then in the discussion, I hope we will go more into detail uh, in, in all the topics that we need to cover. Uh, Livia, I will start with you. Uh, I think we can agree that energy efficiency became quite a political priority in Slovakia and you are in charge of the recovery plan uh, in which there is quite a lot of money allocated for the, for the building sector. So maybe tell us more about uh, these ambitions from the recovery plan, but also I would like to challenge you with a question whether the Slovak government is doing enough for delivering energy efficiency goals. So I will start with energy efficiency. It was rightly pointed out that uh, it's becoming a priority, not just at the EU level, but also here in Slovakia. And if there is a silver bullet in the energy sector, it is energy efficiency. And I think uh, more and more people are getting <laughs> closer to this knowledge and uh, are trying to integrate it, not just in their words, but also in their actions. In the recovery and resilience plan for Slovakia, which I consider the greenest and environmentally most responsible investment program that we have in Slovakia, it's, I would say, not just coming from us, but this were the requirements coming from the Commission that for every reconstruction of the building, you need to save at least 30% of primary energy, if not even, uh, even more. And then also, for instance, recyclation uh, of waste uh, when, uh, when constructing buildings. So definitely all these requirements are making it for us harder to implement. But on the other hand, I would say setting the right principles for the construction sector in the future, not just for, I would say, public money and the EU money, but also more. Uh, more in general. 
In the Slovak Recovery and Resilience Plan, we have 6 billion euros, and out of this, something like 2.7 billion euros are allocated to buildings. And it's not just reconstruction of buildings as such, but we have combined it with uh, substance measures like, for instance, uh, reconstruction of university premises, building of hospitals, uh, reconstruction of courts. So in all these buildings, we have integrated the green elements, and we are trying across all public and sometimes even private buildings to build this uh, urgency that we need to do something in order that we are more energy efficient, that we are more secure, given the current uh, Ukrainian crisis, and then uh, we are emitting less CO2 emissions. So these are, I would say, the priorities that we have in the RRP. I would just mention one of the flagship initiative that is, I would say, quite new in Slovakia. This is the 30,000 family houses that will be reconstructed from the RRP money, and we will spend half a billion euro on this. So it's really one of the biggest uh, investment uh, priorities that we, that we have there. Regarding what can be done more or whether everything is already on track, we have seen in the crisis, when speaking in particular about public buildings, that there is a lot of fragmentation in Slovakia. There is nobody really responsible for all the buildings. So each building has its own manager. So meaning if we are now going to adapt certain measures, how to save energy in public buildings, it's quite dispersed and it's very difficult to get it through. So I think that uh, a measure that we are considering for Repower EU is definitely to be more central on the facility uh, management building in the public sector. And this can bring us not just energy savings, but also financial savings. And it can be definitely beneficial for the environment. Thank you very much. I, we will definitely come back uh, to public buildings and also repower chapter in the discussion. But I would like now to give floor to Justina you come from Poland, where your platform is active. Uh, can you maybe tell us more about ambitions of the Polish government uh, when it comes to delivery, uh, delivering energy efficiency goals, but also maybe compare the ambitions that are set on paper or in strategies uh, with reality? Thank you for the question. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, and thank you for the invitation for this event. Just uh, to introduce myself, I represent uh, Fala Renovazzi, that is uh, Renova Renovation Wave uh, Poland, and we cooperate with the uh, Renovation uh, Renovate Europe campaign as a national partner. And uh, this uh, association was established by the leaders, uh, business leaders and producers of the building materials and technologies that are used for the uh, improvement of energy efficiency of buildings. So just to give you a quick overlook of uh, the situation in Poland, I prepared just one slide, uh, if you could uh, put it on the screen. Uh, so we have uh, quite an old building stock and quite uh, depleted building stock, 70% of our buildings require renovation, 16%, that is 1 million, uh, 1 million more or less, um, are in the worst um, technical stage, 40% are being heated with the solid fuel and gas and fo basically fossil fuels. Um, and now as to the plans. The Poland does have a plan and it is a long-term renovation strategy that was uh, adopted in uh, February this year, uh, just before the, uh, the war uh, in Ukraine. And, uh, and the plan anticipates that uh, there will be two and, two and four uh, million buildings renovated by 2030, and among these, one and uh, 0 0.5 uh, um, that will be deep uh, retrofit. In general, the goal until 2050 uh, anticipates uh, seven and a half million of renovations, which is more or less in, um, consistent with the Fit for 55 package, uh, with the old provision of, of with the current provision of the uh, Buildings Performance Directive, not the uh, more ambitious one, ones that uh, probably will be in place uh, in a moment. But nevertheless, the, pl the plan is quite decent. It, it, it does have a, a kind of pathway uh, of the uh, renovations. 
However, it was not uh, translated into any operational program. So uh, the numbers that are provided in the plan from 2021 are more or less uh, similar today in 2022. Uh, we do have support programs that uh, support mainly private people in making renovations. Out of this building stock, uh, five million buildings are the private uh, individual houses. Half a million are multi-flat buildings. So individual houses are the target, basically. This is the main source of, uh, of uh, problems. Um, and there are programs that um, address the uh, issue of uh, especially... Uh, heating of these houses, but uh, with the changing situation and rising energy prices and heating, and, uh, these programs became obsolete. Basically, people lost interest in exchanging uh, fuel stoves for, for more ecological fuel because they are afraid of losing control, they are afraid of paying more. So we are in the need of the radical change of these programs to address um, buildings renovation and building structure uh, as, as a problem in itself and the exchange of the fuel uh, that is heating those houses as, a, as, a, as an issue as, which is part of, uh, of this problem. So another problem is the quality of renovations that we do believe that um, uh, I mean, we do believe the data shows that the great majority of investments uh, that are being conducted um, restrain, are restrained to exchange of fuel st stove and only minor changes in the structure of buildings. And uh, the reason behind it is not enough money for, um, uh, for renovation, basically. So there are some short-term uh, solutions which are kind of an answer to the uh, problem of uh, buildings, which is the major program, Clean Air Program, which is another new program for multi-flat buildings and uh, better conditions of the retrofit bonus, but they're still not well fitted to the uh, reality, to the material status of people that are potential beneficiaries of this program, and therefore the rollout of renovations is uh, far not sufficient. So we have still 4 million houses that are heated with, um, with coal. That's obviously causing another problem, a huge uh, level of air pollution. I think yesterday was one of the largest in Poland uh, in, uh, in, in the world. Uh, and then, just to finish... Uh, Major problems, well, financing until now, it was available within the framework of the programs. We did not use up the budget of the programs that was anticipated. But obviously a huge issue is lack of recovery and resilience plan. Uh, in Poland, there is uh, more or less 10 billion euros for energy transition and uh, energy efficiency, but uh, due to political discussions, the program is still not uh, working for Poland, there was zero money being spent, so obviously we're very much waiting for this money and very much waiting our self-government as public buildings are obviously an issue and that's the second problem. So apart from the private individual uh, house uh, owners, public authorities and the self-governments, especially um, after well, due to many factors uh, that happened during these uh, last months and years even, are in very difficult uh, financial situation. They have no money for uh, financing renovations of uh, their own building stock. So that would be the, the major issue. And um, if I would have to sum up, lack of the clear-cut goals, lack of the operational programs that would accompany these uh, quite decent, ambitious plans is the major issue that we should uh, look at. Thank you very much. Uh, I picked up three, let's say, topics that I would like to come back to then later in the discussion. First of all, how to make strategies that do impact, not to, not to write them, just to put them in a drawer and not to use them for delivering the goals. The second one, the quality, how to define the quality, how to push for the quality, and then maybe a topic of deep versus quick renovations, because of all the circumstances that we are living, uh, it's probably difficult to focus on deep renovations when we need to 
uh, do the renovations fast and, and, and we need to uh, be ready for the heating seasons. Uh, but we come back to this later. Now I would like to give uh, a floor to Andras, uh, who is from Advanced Building and Urban Design. We discussed uh, his company and the mission of his company during one of the breaks. And I very much liked how you described this uh, approach uh, towards building and the urban planning in a holistic, sustainable way. So maybe tell us more about your company and the mission. And uh, I also would appreciate if you mention some of the examples that we can showcase as a very good examples. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, also thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a quite unique species what we have as a company. Uh, I would say because we, we are working in three different fields very intensively and one I'm sure that most of you know uh, green building certifications, so we are market leader in, in Hungary. Uh, I am not really happy with uh, green building cert certification, maybe we can uh, discuss it later on, but uh, we are working every day with those systems. Then the second one is more, uh, more scientific uh, focused, so we do a lot of uh, R&D projects directly funded by EU, so we take place in consortial uh, agreements from a lot of uh, uh, research institutes, universities. So we do also a lot of publications on a scientific level, which give us uh, also an opportunity to use those theoretical uh, results to implement in the reality. So, and this is what we do in, in, the, in the last uh, place, let's say. Uh, so we, we consult a lot of municipalities, cities, even government sometimes, if they allowed. Uh, however, we, we also work together with real estate developers every day. And uh, by myself, I, I worked uh, yeah, 20 plus, plus years as a design architect. Uh, so we really are confronted day by day uh, what does it take to, to, to be sustainable and uh, not only from the ecological point of view but also from economy and how to serve the society at the end. So this is what we do more or less in, in uh, not only in Hungary, in, in uh, uh, other countries as well. And if you ask me about uh, good case studies, uh, I would be very happy to show you some. Uh, however, I think if we are you know, looking for real and good case studies, uh, then we should maybe first somehow define a uh, net zero concept if we are talking about energy or, or carbon uh, neutrality. So what does it mean? And it's, I think it's quite hard not to, to crack. So uh, I would be also very happy to have some comments also from the uh, audience later on. However, uh, so I don't want to go very deeply right now, but, but maybe the most important takeaway that, that to create positive districts or built environment, it is already an interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral approach. So it's it, it not possible to solve it uh, only as an architect. So we need social scientists as well. So I would very much appreciate next year to, to hear in this conference also a lot of uh, presentation from social scientists because we are talking a lot about how to change the energy, su energy supply system, but at the end, buildings don't use energy. People do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lubica. <laughs> Your turn now. Uh, the passive houses standards are about the legal requirements. Sometimes we even struggle to fulfill the legal requirements and the passive houses want to go even above the requirements. Uh, so it's not always easy to follow uh, the, the passive houses standards. But on the other hand, we are in energy crisis. Uh, so my question would be, do you maybe see a shift in the demand for, for passive houses or passive solutions in the buildings? 
Thank you, Katarina, and thank you for your question and for having me here. Uh, let me first provide some information about passive houses. Uh, they are defined by specific criteria that need to be reached, and it concerns not only newly built, but also renovated houses. The passive house standard is reached by five most important components. Very good insulation, very good windows, high air tightness of building envelope um, as verified by Blaverdor test, um, ventilation system with heat recovery and use of renewables. But the best result always starts with a good plan from, ex from an experienced architect. The Slovak legislation does not require passive house standard, what is a PT, but it has become a ba base for, for nearly zero energy buildings, uh, which are a part of EU legislation. And uh, passive house houses significantly, significantly influenced um, energy efficiency of buildings in general. Um, Passive houses are supported in many countries and have become a part of uh, many uh, subsidies or grant um, uh, schemes, uh, financial schemes, and, and uh, not only in the European Union, but, but also in Asia or the USA. And it is because uh, passive houses are rea reliable and uh, verified building standard which has have been built uh, has been built for more more than 30 years and its popular, popularity is growing as i have already mentioned passive house standard is determined using exact criteria however we could say that it it doesn't need to be so important for future users if the requested criteria are, are not reached more important is if a well-experienced architect uh, designed the building according to the criteria for passive houses, then we can probably e um, uh, expect a good result. And, of course, we are using, using an exact methodology. We are using specialized calculation uh, tools helping to reach the best results. If architects design the buildings carefully according to passive house um, uh, criteria, they create not only aesthetically valuable building, but also energy efficient building and building with added value. And of course, also with a very good um, indoor um, environment quality. So the answer. Um, the interest in passive houses has been growing, and after the uncertain situation with energy supplies, it accelerates. Investors, of course, are worrying, and it generates, generates also a bigger interest. Uh, however, it is obvious that the wider deployment of passive houses needs to be incentivized by our government, but by systematic support from our government, and not only partly or temporarily. The time has come. So I can only confirm at the end of my short intro that Passive House Standard is the best yet known. From Passive House, it is only a small step to zero energy um, buildings or plus energy buildings, and it is very important information. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will come back to that as well in the discussion. But uh, now I would like to give a floor to Lenka Vanek. Uh, I think that it's the situation for uh, the, the region, the CEE region countries, that we rely too much on public financing when it comes to renovation of buildings. Uh, but this might not be enough. So my question to you, um, what would be your suggestion for effective and sustainable financing of, of complex renovations and how can the private sector contribute? Thank you for that question and also thank you for the invitation. Maybe 
before I answer the question, a uh, little bit intro about Chess Esco. Uh, we are the part of Group Chess, which is quite well known in Czech Republic. And ESCO as a energy services uh, focus on a B2B sector. So that's maybe for the intro and explanation when my answer will be focusing on. And also the part of uh, Chess ESCO group is uh, ESCO Slovakia. So we are placed also in here Slovakia, but uh, Chess ESCO is focusing on the Czech Republic mainly, but uh, we also uh, take inspiration for abroad because we have uh, in our group uh, the company Elevion, which is ESCO services abroad in uh, um, uh, in many countries. So back uh, back to your question, and uh, well, it's it's quite interesting because actually uh, the project with the contribution of uh, Private uh, private sector currently exists, I think, 25 years uh, in the in the Czech Republic, and uh, this method is called the EPC. So uh, it's uh, it's energy performance uh, contracting, and uh, this this EPC contract uh, really really mean or the main principle of. Uh, of this EPC is uh, that uh, uh, the, there are the guaranteed uh, the saving of energy and it's paid from uh, the investment is paid for the savings. Uh, so itself, it's, it's really save the money. So you have the, the guarantee that the saving will uh, became reality, which, which I think it's, it's the main issue now that uh, mainly because uh, my team is focusing on innovation and decarbonization. It's like big words and innovation. It's always like uh, really blue skies, but uh, we are really trying to make the business cases even in innovation. So this EPC project, let's say the innovation now is CPC. So we are also focusing on carbon uh, performance contract and uh, uh, we are really delivering these projects to municipalities or regions all over the Czech Republic and uh, we are succeeding uh, uh, the, the savings and uh, actually uh, there are usually overachieved uh, than we guaranteed on the, on the beginning. So uh, this method is also guaranteed or, or recommended from the European authorities. So. I'm really looking forward to use more EPC uh, around all sectors. We have uh, uh, good uh, cases, use cases in hospitals or universities. Uh, there are big savings and uh, it's, it's really projects uh, that... Uh, uh, it's really complex solution. I, I think that's, that's the main cause here because we don't do like uh, this solution and then solution. We look about the calculation for the whole building and trying to find really the complex solution for the best saving on the on the building. And uh, we talk about uh, like heat, water, electric energy, and uh, cooling, and uh, also indoor outdoor lightning. But uh, among these uh, energy performing contracts, I, I, I really see the trend in uh, as a service solution. I think this is becoming really, really top issue nowadays. Uh, it's, it's a really big boom with photovoltaics here with as a service. So there is no investment uh, and, uh, and the company takes place all the solution and we call it for example the green heat or or with with the heat pumps also it's it's possibilities for as a service so i really think as uh, cars used to be like that now we have other parts of uh, our, our industry and i really think this is the future and uh, all the solutions we are trying to develop across the industry in each part this uh, 
look on the financing on different view out of box it's is something which will come also together with the crisis because we need to innovate our our view during the crisis so yeah we'll have a follow up question for you because uh, correct me if i'm wrong but it seems that epc works better in czech republic than in slovakia why do you think uh, this is the case why if something is working well in a setting that is very similar to Slovakia here it doesn't really have well, results to have the epc it mm -hmm. also takes big courage from the <laughs> part of people uh, in in the building itself also on the other side so it's really partnership among uh, among company and or public sector and also, it, it needs the support uh, uh, from from the government itself, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's mm -hmm. also thanks to let's say all the heritage of EPC. It's as I said on the beginning, it's 25 years now, and of course, in, we we struggled on the beginning, mm -hmm. but nowadays we see uh, the results. Mm -hmm. after 10 years, after 15 years, because it's really long-term uh, contract. So uh, when you see it, you believe it. So <laughs> I think that's proved in the Czech Republic and Slovakia mm -hmm. is coming. I really believe in that the boom will come also in the Slovakia. This is very good about the panel that we can inspire each other uh, as, as, as a countries. Uh, I will come back to public buildings now, if you, if you agree. Uh, with our platform, we think that uh, public buildings should lead by example. Yeah? If, if the state uh, promotes energy efficiency of buildings, it should be at the first place buildings of the state that should be, uh, should be setting the standards at a very high level. But on the contrary, it's the reality that uh, the public buildings are not very energy efficient and if there is a renovation it's not very complex renovation so what would be your recommendation how would public buildings uh, how how could they become a leader in in the building renovations justina yeah maybe uh, just to start uh, we need a standard i think that without the common standard that we require some level of uh, energy efficiency, the minimum level to be achieved, uh, it will be very difficult to convince public authorities at local, regional uh, level to go for more ambitious policies because it is more costly. And mm -hmm. what they look at is the capex rather than opex, so they look at the amount of investments at the beginning and they calculate how many, for instance, schools they can renovate. Uh, with uh, limited amount mm -hmm. of money they have. So I would say that first of all, it's the standards, the green building standards, and I know it's very difficult to implement. We started in Warsaw. I used to work uh, in Warsaw as a deputy mayor in charge of uh, sustainability. We embarked on this project to prepare such a standard for Warsaw, and we hope this to be a standard later that could be adopted by other cities. Um, after I left it, uh, actually, the, the work has stalled, uh, but uh, at the level it was already nearly completed. And I believe there was a lot of political issues with this standard. That cannot hear other units um, in the uh, self-government they basically saw it as additional you know complexity difficulty burden. to be implemented mm -hmm. over you know more burden uh, than needed uh, good practices for sure it's a, it's another thing often public mm -hmm. authorities do not have um, idea how to renovate especially with the listed buildings this is a uh, uh, at least in Poland uh, big percentage of, uh, of the uh, public buildings and good regulations actually and a support for, for sure from the, uh, from, uh, from the state. And I see here the question, do you perceive EU funds absorption fatigue? I would say that uh, not really, at least in Poland, especially uh, money supporting this sort of uh, 
good policies uh, with uh, long-term results in terms of environment, in terms of quality of life, in terms of mm -hmm. energy poverty. I mean, uh, they, they would profit very much if, uh, if there would be uh, more financial support. But one more uh, word, the uh, ESCO is obviously extremely important element mm -hmm. of all this picture because no public money will be sufficient to mm -hmm. renovate buildings in any country, I believe. I once calculated for Warsaw and it was more or less 5 billion euros for the uh, buildings uh, in the city, uh, just in, in one city. So it's huge money and it doesn't need to be public money because most of these investments are bankable. So we have to mm -hmm. look for a mix of solutions. Mm -hmm. I very much agree, but if there are more views. Oh, sorry. Uh, in Slovakia, uh, it's, the answer is quite easy because we don't build a new public uh, buildings mm -hmm. and uh, the old one needs to be um, renovated but uh, our legislation is very, uh, it's not so, uh, not so, uh, it's, uh, it's not enough mm -hmm. what we Weak. have in our legislation and uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, that there is a, a very, uh, let's say, loose um, uh, kind of um, information that uh, we know, all of us, uh, if it is functional, technically, and I don't know uh, how mm -hmm. uh, possible. Uh, and, and this is what <laughs> it is always a kind of uh, uh, help mm -hmm. for, for architects and engineers because they they rely on this that if it is not reached the best result then mm -hmm. nothing happened so we have mm -hmm. to change the legis legislation and i think it will come with a new uh, building directive energy efficient building mm -hmm. Olivia? i think that uh, you also had this area whether we should go into deep renovations or mm -hmm. i would say uh, normal Quick. renovations mm -hmm. and uh, if you are really trying to achieve uh, a perfect result, we might not come to any result at all. So that's why for me the implementation phase is much more important than setting new standards. Currently, definitely in Slovakia, I don't know about other countries, but in Slovakia we need to start moving, we need to start renovating at the larger scale, and if we are shifting uh, the benchmark or the technical standard all the time, we will not get there. So this, this is my mm -hmm. first point. And the second point, I also mentioned it in my introduction, that we do not have a central facility management of public buildings. So that's why in Slovakia, there is no expertise, there is no knowledge. If for instance, imagine a school. A school that uh, is managed by a director, and the director should be in charge of a big renovation. He has no skills, he has no experience because it's the first time in mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years or maybe even more that he is doing the renovation. So for me, the biggest reform that Slovakia needs to undertake in this field is really to centralize facility management for buildings, to create an entity that would be the leader in the market regarding uh, skills, regarding the scope of work that they are undertaking. And it will be basically uh, the one knowing which uh, buildings require deep renovation where I would say a moderate renovation is needed. So I would not go via legislation at all. I would really focus on practical implementation and this would be it. I don't know mm -hmm. whether in other countries like in Poland or Hungary or Czech Republic you have centralized the management of public building because here in Slovakia it was not done at all if I can say it mm -hmm. so. Not in Poland? Poland, but uh, I think I would disagree. I think that logic would work for the private buildings when you have uh, instruments uh, encouraging uh, deep renovations mm -hmm. and uh, the accompanying instruments such as uh, some knowledge institutions, uh, one-stop shops, uh, advisory services, and so on for the private people. But public authorities, they do know, I mean, they can get expertise if they want. And uh, they will want only if they have to, because they have too many problems all over. So, I, and I don't think, I mean, in terms of Poland, maybe it's a bit different because Poland is a larger country. Mm -hmm. So I don't think uh, one central authority would solve the issue. I would, rather, uh, I would rather give my trust to the EPBD 
uh, then to the legislation on the national level, and then to the local authorities that are responsible for the, you know, in front of the citizens. And in fact, um, when, when you have a transparent policy, and also we spoke about mm -hmm. the strategy versus policy, uh, the strategies in the, uh, in the drawer versus policies mm -hmm. in the, you know, in life. And uh, when, when the strategy basically becomes equipped with the clear goals and then it gets this transparency um, bonus, let's say, uh, then it's easier for the society to control and to ask the authorities, have you done it or not done? So I believe these instruments are then uh, working Lenka. better. <laughs> Lenka? Maybe I will just add that I really resonate with uh, Livia because the skills and the knowledge, it really helps mm -hmm. to, to move forward. We can really see it in the Czech Republic. We do a lot about education in this field, about EPC, mm -hmm. with the government, with uh, really all the stakeholders, because when they have even the basic knowledge, it really helps to discuss this topic for the hospitals, for the universities, schools, and uh, now it's something you have partner to, to discuss. If on the other side is somebody who just hires some experts and uh, uh, doesn't know why they need it because it's complex and, uh, and uh, it's energy and nobody understands it really well, so it's, it's too complicated and they are lost. They never say it's lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mainly men don't say they are lost, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't Sorry misunderstand for that. me, I'm not against <laughs> knowledge and skills. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. I don't <laughs> see this as excluding things. I mean, this no, is no, no. It's pain, yeah, it's together. Yes. But uh, yeah. this really helps, and uh, I really see from the private sector that uh, this is how we can yeah. move forward with the public ones to show them the good examples, to to show them that uh, it really helps. There is the energy efficiency. There is the saving money. There is innovation. They help them to get more clients and be uh, more happily ever after. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really about the discussion and, uh, and the connection between, and the standards helps. Yeah, but just imagine <laughs> a situation when the city has its in strategy that it has to renovate 300 buildings until year X. And then it starts looking for skills and knowledge and, you know, ways to implement this plan. So, well, we are talking about the yeah. <laughs> and an egg problem. I love strategy. <laughs> I love strategy, but yeah. sometimes it's uh, lost in yeah. that strategy. And it's if it's in the drawer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, Andrej wanted to react as well. Just, just a few not, words, not Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> just a few words. <laughs> I try to be very short. And <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Maybe back to the original question, so it, uh, if the government or, or the public sector should uh, show us some nice examples. And uh, as I mentioned, I, I work a lot as a design architect. And, uh, you know, I don't think that real estate development is a core business of the public sector. Uh, is anybody in the room who experienced a public project in budget? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I realized a lot in the private one, but never in the public sector. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have different levels of, of public uh, projects as well, but for sure not at the governmental level. And, uh, and I try to be on the safe side, so maybe their knowledge is not given mm -hmm. in this uh, area. And there are some municipality projects where I can say, okay, that was nearly budget. However, I think uh, it's, it's very complicated and uh, this lack of knowledge leads to us actually to, to pay much more for those uh, projects. So, and, and I just would like to give you an, an example. So in maybe at 12 years ago, the Hungarian government announced that we will create a lot, a lot, so many thousands workplaces. And I, as I heard this, you know, we had this system, and it was maybe 30, 30, 40 years ago, and we are very happy not to have it anymore. And I, as a private company, would like to have an environment from the legal, from the policy side, to be able to create nice projects. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, if the public, public sector, the government, or the municipalities can pass law and different codes that makes us uh, to be able to create examples for everyone, that would be the nice way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are several other issues as well, but I think uh, it's not the core business. Mm -hmm. It could be nice, and they will also change their mind in a few years, if every, everybody else is doing on the right level of the project, but maybe not yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in an ideal world, we have very good strategies with very good ambitions. Uh, we have enough money, we have enough knowledge, and we have capacities for implementation of all the brilliant projects. Uh, the source, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, the bad news is that we don't live in an ideal world, and now we have uh, too many crises going on in Europe. Uh, we have war uh, going on in the neighboring country, and there is, you know, quite a lot of uh, demand for quick solutions. So, what should we? What would you recommend to focus on now? And I'm also maybe uh, leading this towards this uh, discussion whether quick uh, measures on the buildings would not do more harm than good in the long term. Like, what, what is better, to wait and to focus on complex renovation or just forget about ideal strategies and complex renovations and uh, just do the, the measures quickly? Can I? For, yes. the, for the industry, we really saw it when, when the crisis came after COVID that the independence was the main issue to, to really be able to deliver. Mm -hmm. So we did projects in shorter time, which was like five months, let's say, in the energy sector. Uh, not, not the middle period, a year or two. So EPC project usually are a year or, or two. So we, we really delivered the, the project for, to, to make independence in the buildings or for the, for the industry. So the energy was the topic and uh, it was the boom with photovoltaics to really have uh, something I can rely on and I can focus on the next part to uh, do the strategy to do other mm -hmm. things and usually this is the discussion with our clients okay you want to do something for decarbonization you want to do something for independence right now so here are several solutions you can do mm -hmm. in the short term and then we can build together the strategy for the longer term and you can show us why you want to do it because the why is always the issue because there are different uh, different types of uh, clients, why they want to do the strategy, do the uh, decarbonization or do the efficiency of the building. Mm -hmm. So the, the main cause, it's, it's, it's usually the, the big discussion, why they want to do it and uh, give them time to do it. Mm -hmm. I would actually uh, recommend in every project, and every project is different, and that's why I'm mm -hmm. talking more strategically. So the three steps, what, steps what we are doing in every project is looking how to reduce the demand, then the second, how to increase the efficiency, and only the last part is how to cover uh, what remains, you know? And uh, just to make a <laughs> very, very simple parallelity, I, I do a lot of climbing and mountaineering, and if you are asking uh, any climbers how to be on, the, be on the fastest way, it's stronger, is weight lost. <laughs> and the second step is, you know, just making your moves more efficient. And only the last one, which costs a lot of money and time to be stronger. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. really, and, and this is the lowest, lowest hang hanging fruit, how to reduce the demand. And, and that's why I was talking about social science. So if you can not directly change your behavior, but, but somehow to going in that direction that, that I am the one who is turning on the thermostate, 
and I am the one who is not taking a jacket or even taking a jacket in the summer as well in, in the interior, why I had, have to cool down this interior. So this is, this is what we are following, and I'm just talking now about energy, but there is also water and, and, uh, and other resources like, uh, uh, like materials and so on. So those three steps, steps you, can, you can go really on the fastest way mm -hmm. to reduce the, the economical uh, need at the end, so what you have to invest. Because everybody, everybody is asking, yeah, what is a sustainable building? And if you see any PV on the roof, then you are pointing out, yeah, this is a sustainable building. But how to know it? You know, if you are putting on, a, on an old house with any renovation process or changing the, the efficiency of the system, you are just putting PV on the, on the roof that will cost at least a double than what you would need actually mm -hmm. after doing these three very simple steps. Mm -hmm. Okay, no? you just have? yes, go ahead. Following on that, <laughs> I believe, I mean, when we come back to the public policies, that we need to redefine our goals, first of all. Mm -hmm. And resilience is ability to answer the shocks of, of different nature. So we cannot stay with the same goals and with the same policies in a completely new circumstances that we have and we yes. experience since many months. So I believe, like, very generally, that when it comes to public buildings and especially from the perspective of the self-government, the high energy costs are the probably highest problem. So the low-hanging low fruits, to pick them up, mm -hmm. basically to measure how much energy we're using, which buildings are the ones that um, require intervention and which sort of intervention, I don't think we can give one answer for all, whether this mm -hmm. should be a uh, deep retrofit of, or general uh, um, intervention, general uh, renovation. And we actually did one study in Warsaw uh, analyzing 50 schools and uh, in context of the plant ESCO project. And the advice was not to actually make deep retrofit of all of them because the uh, best climate uh, result in terms of climate and in terms of costs was the mix of solutions. So mm -hmm. I would look at the concrete cases. And in terms of private buildings, energy poverty is honestly something that we, the scope of the problem that we haven't experienced. And I believe that uh, we need to, apart from you know, changing the goals, we need to um, prioritize. And, and this is an absolute mm -hmm. priority to supply people with heat and energy for winter. And I, and I know about Slovakia and, uh, and uh, other countries in the region, but in Poland it's for sure a huge problem. And therefore I would propose much higher level of financing and of uh, all sorts of aid uh, provided by public authorities to uh, take these people out of the situation that is, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't allow for that basically. Mm -hmm. And then if we already invest public money um, into this sort of renovation, I would, I think, uh, stick to the deep retrofit because it's the only permanent solution that mm -hmm. uh, does not require further investments. So if we finance generously from the public money these sort of uh, renovations, we should also require certain standards, so obviously audits and, uh, and proper... Um, order of works should be, uh, should be uh, well, uh, mm -hmm. looked after. Yeah, for, for Slovakia, I can confirm that we don't have sufficient data about public buildings. Uh, and maybe I would, uh, Olivia, <laughs> have a question for you. I think that that's what I was suggesting, that in the public buildings we yes. do not have data, they yes. are not digitalized. So that's why I'm speaking that we need more centralization in the management of public buildings, because otherwise nobody knows what are the priorities, what should be done first, uh, and what are the overall needs, how to manage the whole process, skills, etc. Yeah. So for me, when we are speaking about public buildings, this is, in my view, a silver bullet that will help Slovakia right now to move forward with uh, this energy, with the um, reconstruction of public buildings. But you mm -hmm. rightly pointed out that for private buildings and for, in particular, family houses, the big question is basically that 
the government needs to spend a huge amount of money now on energy compensation. So these are cash handouts. And whether a quick renovation is basically better than a cash handouts that will be done this year, maybe next year and uh, later. This is, I would say, something that needs to be calculated. Of course, the optimal solution is deep retrofit, but not everybody can uh, basically mm -hmm. pay it from his own pocket and public money, in my view, should not 100% basically cover the needs of uh, be it private houses or industry. For industry, I think that we anyhow mm -hmm. have stated rules, but for private houses, I don't think that there should be no motivation that it's just basically public money that is spent on, on private households. So hopefully we will see this in the recovery chapter and it, this will give us space for, for, a, for a reform in Slovakia, but Lubica wanted to react. Sorry, I would only shortly add to, to the topic of public buildings that I think uh, each public building should become a lighthouse. Uh, and, uh, and motivate and demonstrate, motivate others and demonstrate its approach. So this is, I think, very important to, to have some pilots. And uh, th there were some information that they, they, they don't want to spend money because it, it will be regar regarded uh, like uh, something that they could offer this money for other. But, uh, but um, I would say it, it's very important to show uh, how should be public uh, building renovated uh, and what are these measures um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. that has, has been taken. And, uh, and uh, also I, I wanted to, to say something uh, regarding the other topic and now I have forgotten, sorry. <laughs> so we come back to that, but okay. let's go to Slido questions <laughs> because... Because okay. uh, just to follow up on this, uh, on this uh, sentence about the public handouts, we spend in Poland already more than twice more for public handouts for people to support mm -hmm. them with, uh, with money yes. for, the high, for the growth of uh, increase of prices of uh, fuel and uh, fuel basically. Uh, twice more than was spent for the uh, retrofit or, or the program for the uh, cleaner program it's called, which was focused mainly on the uh, exchange of fuel, but also uh, some retrofits. So we, it's as you said, I mean, we need mm -hmm. evidence-based policies mm -hmm. when we calculate and we see what is more uh, f uh, beneficial for, for the society. Yes, definitely. Okay. We just, just I, I heard again that, that we don't have data and uh, okay. you, my don't have data, but, but my question is then in 10 years we will sit here also and talking a lot that we not. don't have data. <laughs> so uh, I, think, I think of course, but in, in an age where, where digitalization is an option to get the data also in a proper and, and quite quick way, I think the politicians, so this is only a political question and decision and nothing else. And I think this mm -hmm. is the core business of politic. So we have the technical solutions for that. Mm -hmm. And normally the countries also have the money. The question is for what they, they spend it. And we know that on the long term to, to invest in the building stock, this is the lowest hanging fruit if we would like to, to, to save emissions. Nobody debates about that. So it's, it's, it's longer hanging fruit than transport and anything else. So how to make it a political priority then? It's not just how to make it a political priority, but also at a technical level. Mm -hmm. If each director of a school is in charge of a renovation or should think about renovation, it will never work. Mm -hmm. So you need really to have specialized entity that has its core task just to take care of buildings and then it will work. Because imagine you are a director of a school. How many uh, percent of your energy time and money are you spending on this issue? One, two? <laughs> Definitely not more. How can you manage the contractual relationship with somebody who is going to do the renovation? There is so much informational asymmetry on this. So you need experts also on the public side in order that you can manage the project. 
Well, I agree. And then you don't know, as a director of this particular school, if this school should have this renovation and if that's a priority with the limited amount of resources of maybe the neighboring school that is in a yeah. much worse condition. So I do believe that some sort of data is... Uh, the data gathering is important, and my experience is that self-government cities, big cities in Poland, do not have uh, data sets, databases uh, in buildings. And you are mm -hmm. right, uh, it's because of lack of political priority. It's not uh, visible, it's difficult to mm -hmm. politically sell renovation as an achievement. Some cities did that, there are some exp examples like in France, in Bordeaux, uh, where, where they mm -hmm. show all around the world the cases of public buildings renovations, but I cannot think of single renovation in Poland, like let's say complex, uh, deep retrofit that I could give as an example, mm -hmm. like an obvious example. We don't have it because mm -hmm. it's not political focus, and although we speak about it, it at every conference, uh, it's still not uh, publicly recognized. Uh, once the public will recognize, then politicians will recognize. Exactly. Exactly. I, I think this is the good question. Why, is it, why isn't this the, the political priority? And this is a completely different question than to ask why we don't have data. Mm -hmm. okay? So I think, I think if we would like to go that direction that we should discuss very much the multiply benefits of the retrofit, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how to think about new economical rules and how those, those influences on a multiply level could influence an efficiency of a whole society if we have deep renovations. And how to show them. Yeah, how exactly. So th 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 this question. is the right question, I think. So, I, I, sorry, I, I don't want to be too, too, you talk too direct. So much. It's I mean, just, it's good, it's but just we very, have very very close. Close. Yeah. You, you presented as something in opposition. Okay. I don't think so. It's a, there are elements yes. of the same puzzle. Yes, yes, yes exactly. Livia. still react to what you are suggesting that it is sufficient to make it a political priority. If you are speaking about a single pipeline, yes, that's right. If you are speaking about energy efficiency, that's a necessary precondition, but not a sufficient one. Because in Slovakia, I can imagine that the prime minister will declare energy efficiency as the highest priority. <laughs> but we have no tools how to achieve it at the technical level. I am now really uh, mm -hmm. working with uh, various line ministries, working with uh, different kind of, uh, I would say, issues that we are dealing with. And if technically it's not ready, in a very multiple field like energy efficiency, the political courage or the political uh, visibility is not sufficient. So that's why I am speaking in favor of this big reform that would give us the tools. Also, for instance, there is one question mm -hmm. about uh, the renovation of uh, 30,000 private mm -hmm. houses that we have in our recovery and resilience plan. It's not just sufficient to uh, give money if there is no demand, if there is no sufficient demand. We have one, uh, one million family houses in Slovakia. 30,000 might seem, I would say, a rather limited uh, amount of this. But when you take into account that the yearly rate of renovation is around 1%. We are aiming at 4%. This is enormous what we are speaking about. Mm -hmm. We have launched the scheme in uh, October. October. Mm -hmm. And so far, we just have 1,300, mm -hmm. something like this. Uh, and this is not basically a realization. It's just the number of applicants. So and it's why really going very slowly. You need to take into account that they are in a various situations, these people that uh, should normally ask for money, but if they are in a divorce proceeding, if mm -hmm. they basically are just too old to get anything done. So it's not that easy just to basically uh, give it a political priority and uh, spread money uh, across various fields of energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. And in particular, when we are speaking about households, when we are speaking about vulnerable, be it mm -hmm. households or clients, these groups, it's not just money. They need technical assistance. And these are very costly issues. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would take two other questions from Slido. And I think it would be Andras and Lubica who can, um, or maybe Justina also. Do you think that projects from Vienna, Zestadt, or all the projects, uh, Alterla, are a good example how to use green energy or re reuse materials. 
And then there is another question, is there a business case in our region for energy companies to provide households with energy services rather than just energy supplies? I don't know the project from Vienna. <laughs> maybe somebody can explain Maybe, some, maybe somebody knows. But Andras? Yeah? It's you, please. You're welcome. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, actually, I, I like very much Zeestadt. Uh, however, uh, I see also better projects in in, in Austria, especially in, in Salzburg, so where the whole ecological footprint of the whole project is, is much better. Uh, and, and this is an interesting uh, issue what you mentioned as well with the new EPBD. So I think it would be very important to include in the EPBD in, in a certain time LCA, so life cycle analysis as well, mm -hmm. which is mis missing right now. And uh, I think I think the goal from Zeestadt wasn't to create uh, a, a zero carbon city in, 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 in the holistic way, which means through the construction and so on. So it, it was much more a case study how to make a, a smart grid and, and uh, uh, ICT on the highest level in the built environment. Uh, so I, I see it as, as, as a good example and uh, trying something out, but uh, is not my favorite project in Austria, if we are talking about it. Well, okay, I, I just wanted mm -hmm. to complete something uh, to the previous mm -hmm. uh, question, because uh, we, uh, we have spoken uh, about uh, mainly about public buildings, but on the way of, uh, to climate neutrality, we need to have all buildings as efficient as possible. And uh, in this way, I would say that uh, these data, which are devils uh, in, the, in, this, in this whole uh, topic, are very much important because without data, we, do, we are not able to create scenarios. And so where is the start? It's, this is what we need to, to very quickly uh, uh, change and, uh, and uh, to find a systematic, um, systematic um, approach to this uh, very mm -hmm. big problem, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, can we see other Slido questions? Because there are three the more. Yes? Not answered about the business case. I know a okay. case, for instance, in the uh, outskirts of Warsaw, when uh, the company that supplies uh, district heating, mm -hmm. the district heating supplier, Veolia, uh, actually invested in, uh, in the area where there are no pipes uh, being uh, well connected because it's too far and uh, uh, the houses are um, not, dense, the, not dense enough. So they provide these houses, this is a new development with the heat pumps, and they service the heat pumps, they have agreement with the future owners, and, uh, and heat, heat pumps remain within uh, the company, let's say. So it's sort of solution for areas that are uh, well, not fit for the district heating. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe Olivia for this one. Do you see a need for uh, the social climate fund to be established and what should be the rules and criteria for using the money? The idea is to enlarge the emission trading scheme to, to buildings and to transport. So that's mm -hmm. why there was this idea to create an additional fund that will compensate vulnerable groups. And there is a debate whether it should just fund this energy efficiency improvements or whether it should serve also to give uh, cash handouts to the population. So in this situation when we are facing really steep increases in energy prices, uh, it would be nice to have an EU-wide instrument because some countries are more uh, impacted by, uh, than, than, than others. But this should come uh, into, into force, I think, by 2025 or 2026. So I would say that uh, in countries like uh, Slovakia, we are grateful for the, for the EU funding. We are also grateful that it comes with certain strings attached that is spent to, to priorities. But uh, I don't have any particular feelings about mm -hmm. this, uh, this fund. So. Yeah, but the next question is also... Uh, 
okay. maybe for you <laughs> to clarify the <laughs> establishment of a public building management facility is it part of the recovery plan so far mm -hmm. it is not we have tried to include it there but uh, at the time i think that the political uh, atmosphere was uh, was not right now with the ukrainian crisis i think that we have more chance to include it in the repower eu Repower EU is an additional bunch of money that should come to enhance the green components of, uh, of the recovery and resilience plan. The final discussions at the EU level should be finalized uh, by December or January, mm -hmm. and then all countries will have the possibility to include the recover EU component uh, into the recovery and resilience plan. And we are already working on some ideas what can be there and this uh, Management uh, facility is something that we are strongly considering. Mm -hmm. oh, we run out of time, but I think we can take two more minutes for a final question. I would like to uh, make a round with one question. Um, it's, it relates to re Ukraine, because we can probably assume that our region will play a crucial role uh, when hopefully soon the war, war will be over and the rebuilding of Ukraine will come. So my question, final question in this discussion is, uh, do you think we are ready for this role and what can we offer in this field to Ukraine to, to help them rebuild the country? No, I was Poland. As well, a <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, well, we have a will to help, obviously, and uh, there will be, uh, well, apart from the human case, also a business case, as was mentioned today in the previous panels as well. But we need to build a, a supply capacity because we would have to supply our own country and uh, other, um, other needs. Uh, and in order to do so, I believe we need European regulations, I would go for that, that support uh, long-term programs and uh, mm -hmm. long-term um, um, demand for production uh, materials for, for energy efficiency in general. And we need uh, some financing that would play a role of the engine the growth, which will not be sufficient, as I said earlier, for covering all the needs, but will basically steer an interest. And... Um, yeah, and once we manage to build a strong base in our countries, we will be ready also to expand it to the, mm -hmm. you know, to the outside the outsiders. I believe that's mm -hmm. the, that's the order it should happen. Mm -hmm. Andras? Yes, I, I think we, we do have the possibility and, and we are also ready for it. Uh, however, I think most importantly, we should ask them what to help. Mm -hmm. and this is the... I think it's always a you know, possible failure to make that I know what I should do in your country. Mm -hmm. okay. So and, and you, can ch you can see this in, in, in several region, regions where it happened not the same, but, but very similar situations that uh, Western countries are going there and they, they are saying, yeah, this is the best for you. No, I think we should ask them. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I would say um, that um, in Ukraine it's an interesting situation because they, um, they weren't uh, involved uh, so much in energy efficiency of buildings. They uh, didn't need it. And I was in contact with one uh, Ukrainian architect. She told me that uh, it's not a topic in the Ukraine and so this is a little bit different. But uh, I think, I think uh, the new buildings uh, will need to be efficient because the, the situation is changing. And also from my uh, last experiences uh, as a part of Manifest 2020, which is a, an official partner of uh, mm -hmm. um, New European Bauhaus, we, we, we were involved in a, in a let's say, small project uh, which was launched by Japanese architect Shigeru Ban. He offered uh, his um, solution, so-called paper partition system, so we mm -hmm. helped Ukrainian people to, to, some, to spend the first day in Slovakia in these shelters. It's, it's, a, 
it's a very simple, simple construction from paper tubes uh, covered with uh, fabrics, and it helped uh, the families a lot uh, to have some privacy and intimacy in this hard time. So I, I would say that, um, um, yes, uh, mm -hmm. we, we need to help them to find um, a new solution for building. So okay. I, will, I, will, I would be pleased to help. To be fair, I would still like to give a word to Lenka and Livia, <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, maybe just from my point of view, the, the, our resilience in saying no to any fuels from Russia, it's also mm -hmm. the big help for Ukraine mm -hmm. and showing our respect and support in this way. And maybe one example I saw uh, in the Czech Republic uh, was the company who developed uh, the 3D print for the houses. Uh, they use it uh, now for the defense uh, uh, way, and, but uh, for the future after, after war, I believe this is also one of uh, the things uh, how, how can help to Ukraine with innovations, with new, really new uh, way how to build the houses, mm -hmm. how to give them their home back. So mm -hmm. this 3D building prints, I, I see really interesting. Okay. Rebuilding of Ukraine is definitely a task that's beyond the scope of abilities of the V4 region, despite definitely the willingness of Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia to help. In particular, regarding financing, uh, it is, I would say, a far bigger cake that <laughs> we, can, uh, we can afford. So what we can think about, how to make it a business opportunity in order to make it a win-win situation for mm -hmm. us, for Ukraine, in order that it works, that we are building infrastructure links that are missing, at least on the Slovak side, I don't know, for, for other neighboring countries, mm -hmm. that we can maybe export uh, our experience, how to deal with uh, reception of the EU funds, as I think that our mentality is closer to Ukrainians, and for instance, the German ones or the French one. So I see, I would say, many similar Mm -hmm. where we can be of help, but really the biggest chunk of money will come from, from other regions. And also I would say that uh, when speaking about big reconstruction projects in our country, I am not sure whether we can cover all of this given, I would say, the capacity of the construction sector. Mm -hmm. Also regarding Ukraine and maybe also responding very briefly to the question that is uh, on the slide. Whether, even too, whether we have too much money in the, the V4 region or whether we need more money. The needs are normally like this, not just in the Ukraine, but also in the V4. Then the EU money or the money that is available is somewhere here. And in Slovakia, absorption capacities are even below mm -hmm. <laughs> the EU funding that is coming. I don't know whether it's true also for other V4 countries, but we are struggling to use mm -hmm. all the monies with all the strings attached, with all the requirements, mm -hmm. etc. So I think that for Ukraine, it would be a very similar story that uh, they would need much more money that would be available, but even the money available would be very difficult to use in the manner that the EU or other international donors uh, mm -hmm. uh, would like them to use it. With this, we have to close the panel, I'm sorry. But thank you very much for your active participation and thank you for listening. There will be another panel after a coffee break, so enjoy the coffee. Thank you. Thank you.